Welcome to Burrated, B-Rated Conversations. Join us as we talk to the creative people behind the independent movies and get the behind-the-scenes stories. Thank you for listening to this episode. In this episode, I talked to Chris Cronin, director of The Moor. This movie is available on streaming and select theaters in the UK. This movie is the story of Bill, a father whose son went missing 25 years ago, and Claire, a girl with psychic abilities. They are aided in their search for his missing son in The Moor by a group of searchers, including Eleanor and Thornley. This movie is directed by Chris Cronin and stars Sophia Laporta, David Edward Robertson, Elizabeth Dormer Phillips, and Bernard Hill. Well, thank you for being here. I'm here with Chris Cronin, director of The Moor. How are you doing? Oh, yeah. Uh, So this movie, um, I I have to say, I got it from, uh, like, I've been getting these emails from Strike Media about, uh, like, different... uh, different movies and this was one of them and i checked it out and was like this is just distinctly different than anything i think i've ever watched um oh wow that's high praise that's that's yeah okay like i i loved i love different and um this movie really like like when i it said you're a first time director well, they always say like first time director, but it's like my first feature. So I've made okay. horror shorts okay. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But like this is my first foray into like feature films. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like this movie, it really does feel like they're really like you are creating your vision. There's not really a template. It's not like this worked in other movies, so I'm gonna do this in this one. Like it's uh it starts out very like true crime, like you're like for me, I'm a parent. Like that's my like we talked about this a little mm. bit prior. Like it's my worst nightmare. Uh, yeah. you know, like, like you, you know, like they talk about helicopter parents and stuff like that nowadays, and it's just like that's why. <laughs> <the whole thing. laughs> yeah. Well, okay. well the my question to you then, having seen it, like, do you ever go Bill's? Can you swear on this podcast? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So you go Bill's an asshole, or do you go oh, kind of get it? I kind of get it. Like, where do you sit without then being a parent? Uh, I, that's the thing. Um, I have a hard time judging it because like, I do feel like there is a world in which that decision makes sense because in the moment, like you, you know, the things you should do and the things you shouldn't do. And like you don't always make the decision you should make kind of thing like so it would be hard for me to judge another parent and like and say like that's just wrong like yeah and it's like 25 years of that that guilt as a father that couldn't protect his son building yeah do you know what i mean like what does that manifest like it's 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 really interesting I've, i've read stuff about it saying like Sometimes you want to call Bill. Bill's the main character of the movie. You want to call Bill out, but then at the same time, you just feel just really bad for the guy. And well, that's the, I like yeah. it when people have them kind of conflicts with the movie. That's 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 the that's the juice. That you know what I mean? Well, I I kind of feel like that's also um, like if you've developed really good characters in a movie, there will be conflict, and there's not good guy bad guy, uh, good guy beats bad guy, or good guy should beat bad guy, and it's like who like who is our our who is our bad guy here and like that's that's better to me mm. and that's where it's, it's I interesting really, yeah like i think you hit that on the head no Sorry. That, that's awesome well no no it's interesting i've got a bit of a delay but like what's really interesting is i was worried about you know the horror trope of the father going crazy and turning and uh oh, you say spoiler reviews but you can see from the trailer that you know whatever he bill goes he's a little bit desperate with the situation that he's in yeah, um, obviously the the person he believes, you know, killed his son, is getting out of prison, and now he wants to do anything he can to find proof to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and so throughout the film, you're watching this guy get more and more desperate. And I was aware of the trope that you know amateurville horror, like the father slowly goes insane, and that was one of the interesting challenges of the movie was trying to make it just you're not just watching the train go down the train track. You're going like, no, still come on, like. You can yeah. turn left and you go, it's a train track, but you're like, no, turn, just turn, Bill, <laughs> just turn left. 
Claire will save you. Like you, is that's what this movie's about. I love it when you go. I know where this is going. I still want it to go some. I, I, I'm willing it to go somewhere else. And you're like, there's something about in horror where the inevitable isn't predictable. It's just it's it's part of the experience. Do you know what I mean? So it's it, that was always really interesting. Going, oh, okay, so this is a trope. How do you make this trope land when we know all of the tropes? Do you know what I mean? It's it's not. How do you make it not cliche? And uh, I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I kind of feel like um, like it was interesting to see him be the illogical or rational one. And for your psychic or your your telepathic, is it, I, I get those terms kind of confused, but like like to see her be the more true north and the, like the guide and the like, you know, like you're kind of the the um, the conscience. Yeah. Yeah, because she got the, the lead, Claire, is kind of, she's guilt-ridden, but she's almost subdued emotionally. She's kind of, um, I think over the years, has kind of shut down. So she's trying to do what's right, but it's a little overwhelming for the character. And Bill's the opposite. He's like, I'm all my emotions are out on the surface, and I'm going to go do what needs to be done. So when you have, like, like say, a psychic come in, um, and she's kind of the rational one, <laughs> kind of to keep everybody in check is really interesting. I like her as an empathetic character. When she shows up, it almost kind of completes the team, doesn't it? So that was one of the interesting things of making this movie was just trying to create um the, the challenge was the um the good group dynamic. Like it's an oh, ensemble yeah, cast in a way. Yeah. So that was that was a challenge for me. A first time feature filmmaker. I was like, I've got an ensemble on my hands here with a lot of personalities, a lot of backstories, uh, how to make them fit and makes sense but i was quite i was quite happy with that i think they're they're a good team good scooby-doo gang oh yeah definitely like i i do feel like um it's easy for characters to get lost in the mix and like feel underdeveloped and some characters feel overdeveloped and like that i didn't feel that with this i feel like i understand everyone and i understand their motivations and their thoughts and it, it was a a good blend that's cool yeah because there's that for horror to work, sometimes you need characters to be a little illogical. You know what I mean? Like, what's that noise? Yeah. And you go, doesn't matter. Don't go after that noise. Um, yeah. But we all want to go after that noise. Like, what's that noise <laughs> is the best bit of the film. Like, don't go into the woods. Um, but if you ground the characters in so much, like, make it so grounded, so real for a character, if they go do something irrational, but you've set it up that you completely understand why they would do it, and then you, it's just, again, it elevates that dread, that horror going, I don't think you should do that, but I understand completely why you're doing it. And the, one of the things was an early decision, um, you know, that obviously there's inspirations. We can go from like, you know, The Wicker Man, which is a very, very popular UK movie with a, you know, folk horror vibe um, that I took inspiration from. But you can also pull The Blair Witch Project. And there was always an argument of, should we do like the Blair Witch, you go into the woods, you never leave. That's the state, you shouldn't have done it. And we're like, well, isn't it horrible that you go up to the moor and you come back and you go, we need to go back. And you go, oh, isn't that kind of horrible that you got off it and you got away with it, but you're willing to go back despite yeah. knowing it's not a good idea? Um, that's something we kind of enjoyed playing with, which kind of played on against what the Blair Witch did. Because I think in, in any other circumstances, people would just go, you go on the moor, you never come off, which can work. It does, it would work, but it's just, I think I would have seen that coming a little bit. I like the idea that as characters, they have to choose to go back. And that kind of messes me a little bit. Like you could have left, you could have left. Oh yeah, definitely. And like, I think that was one of the moments I was just like, don't do it. Don't do it. And whenever you <laughs> like start like rooting for the characters to like make a good decision. I think that's when you start to become invested. Yeah. There's literally, there's a moment. And again, you said spoiler free. So there's a moment at the end of the movie where you start to kind of, you feel like you're pulling the character to the light and, and, and you're going, Oh, okay. We're back. It's rational. And it's like a glimpse and it's just toying with you really. Cause you're just like, this is a horror film. Like, these guys are in extreme circumstances that we we do not want to be in. So, so it's 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 fun to 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 
it's almost cathartic, isn't it? Going like, let's see these demons fully realized and stuff like that. I always kind of really enjoy stuff like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see what people, because obviously it's an ensemble, which characters people resonate with the most. It seems to be different depending on the person, which I, I really like. Well, yeah, for me, um, I, I I mean, I, I feel like I've been this way since I was a kid. Like, I always, re- I always uh, sort of empathize with the bad guy like i want to understand how you got where you got there and um like the thing is like um i want to say like bill is really he's he's kind of a shade of gray like you know like you do a really good job of building this uh you know this story behind him so he was you know he was a he was a dad he was you know he was a good dad he made a decision the decision wasn't great and uh and it's you know sort of but like that was i kind of feel like maybe that was like the 80s it was like it was like we didn't know anything about anything you know like uh the idea of you know like murderers and predators and things like that it was just like oh that'll never happen to my kid like because i remember you know like you go out yeah and you that, that like, just saying that just saying that is it's the lottery ticket isn't it yeah it's the worst lottery ticket you could ever get yeah yeah it was like you you come back in when the street lights come on because now it's time for dinner like nowadays like i go outside with my son and it's like it's like stay stay where i can see you <laughs> like yeah we know too much i kind of think now or yeah which in some now. ways is it, yeah yeah i think some ways it's a good thing some ways it's actually quite tragic i don't know like i'm a 90s kid so i used to you know play games in the fields outside the house until it got dark and your parents would yell your name and then you come back in for food yeah but um two parts that's the bill gray thing and uh, you know the kid thing so like the opening sequence we didn't so this this film started as a treatment which was all found footage and whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I, I just, me and my brother, who's the cinematographer, we just go, this, we like the more normal route of narrative, uh, you know, fiction narrative, um, cinematography and all that kind of stuff. Even though I do like found footage, it's just not, my instincts don't go there immediately, even though probably my favorite, as a horror fan, my favorite part of this film is the found footage part. I was oh, yes, like, definitely. oh, I, oh, you agree? Okay, cool. So, well, um, I thought it was, well, it was, the way it was used, it was used effectively that I feel like too much found footage. We get lots of these like little like, you know, moments to try to like build up the tension and then the thing happens and then we go back to building up the tension and then the thing happens. And it's like like building a story around found footage is difficult sometimes. Yeah, I didn't like getting locked into the logistics of the rules and all that kind of stuff. I like I think if. If I did another movie, then we want you to do found footage. I probably would get into the rules and be excited by that. But for this story, it was like, well, I want to show the. So what's nice about the Moors is we show the vastness of it. But thankfully, some people say it still feels quite oppressive because of the weather and the color and the landscape. And I'm not like I don't want to see Claire go. Oh, I've just learned how to use a drone. I'm going to send a drone up now. And we're watching her get into the gadgets and stuff like that. I just wanted to kind of go. We've got the body cam. When things get real, we've always got the body cam, and uh, we can also do the um, the interviews, which really again grounds the film. So to make so for your listeners, my film is set in a certain part of the UK. It's in Yorkshire. It's in the north, below okay. Scotland, and um, it's it's got its own sense of place. And so what I did was to make you really get a sense of that was was interview real Yorkshire people and uh, give a little history into what actually happened. And it's what they happened. Either they were a parent during the time the kids went missing or they were a kid and now they're adults trying to remember what it felt like. And um, I I really like all that stuff. So I didn't want to lose that, even though we didn't shoot a found footage film. So like, like you mentioned, we, we spliced it in there where appropriate. And, um, and to mention the, the the thing with the, the kids playing out the opening sequence, because it was a treatment as a found footage film, we literally had it as like a person talking to camera, like, hey, we're here now. This is what's happening. I'm filming a documentary, da da da. And it was done in 20 seconds. And it was like, how do you start the film if you can't have that? And so 
we were racking his brains and I just went, if it's Yorkshire, like, you know, corner shops, like mm-hmm. that's very Northern, like, you know, like you go to the corner shop for sweets, you buy your mum some cigarettes, whatever you did, like, and then you would get cheeky and maybe you try and pinch a sweet or two because you're just, you're, you're little and nothing can happen to you. I, I, and, I, was, um, I was like, that's a very, like a kid behavior. It's like, I'm going to buy something, yeah. but I want to see if I can get away with something. Yeah. Like she probably could have done it with the change, but nah, I want to, I want to see if I can do this, like yeah. test the fences. And um, that was inspired by, so when I was working with a writer, that was me going, actually, this is something that would happen to me. I've never stole sweets. I'm winking to you if it's all sound. <laughs> but um, but that's what we're what trying to do is like, here's the peril as far as the kids are concerned. And then here's what's really good. The, you know, the illusion. So she's scared of a shopkeeper. That's the least of their worries. And then the, the real thing happens. And the scary thing is about that is I was talking to the sound guy and I was like, you need to play, you need to play the sounds of kids playing. If there's no sounds of kids playing. I was like, you need to have the sounds of kids playing in the distance. Yeah. Because that's a foreign sound now. That doesn't happen. We don't hear that anymore. You have to go to a specific place to hear that. Usually you just step out of your house and you would hear it. Kids playing ball, you know, whatever. Like, it's a different time in the, in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s. Like, you, kids don't play out like that anymore. It's very strange. Well, yeah, it, it was it was really nostalgic. It it felt mm. like when like when I was a kid, like it it doesn't feel like now. Like you kind of have no. to like pull the kids out to play. It's like, oh, my friend's out. I'm going to go out. And it's like but you, nobody really goes out on their own. But you remember when your friend just knocked on your door and go, do you want to come out? And you're like, yeah, that doesn't happen ever. It's like a text or a WhatsApp. Do you want to, do you want to join on Twitch and hang out? But like, yeah. But um, it's 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 yeah, I, I I miss it a little bit, but um, probably didn't help that matter by doing that opening sequence. I didn't I didn't, I didn't restore faith in parents to push the kids outside anymore. So, well, no, but, but it did really like lend to the sense of dread that kind of like that that comes over this movie that the like like when you when you're in the moors, the dread feels more. When you're away from the moors, it feels like this like. You know, there's there's you like you you feel it, but at the same time you're away from it, and it's like um, I did um, I did enjoy that you pull away from the moors for a while to give us a a sense of like the the difference between the two. Mm. Um, so there's you know, uh, but like the the um, there was a really good like blend to this movie. How you have the cinematic feeling and you have the documentary feel and you have the um the found footage feel because there was uh another movie that i remember it was um horror in the high desert uh uses documentary footage but also has interviews and like and it's effective that way because you're adding context to the um to the found footage and it makes it creepier so that that was it was, I, I i liked that choice well, it, it, I'm glad I'm glad you do. Uh, I think what was really nice about it was I, I wanted it to, and it was a, you know, it was I think it was in the writing as well. It was like you feel trapped in the found footage. So in a, you could say full found footage, you'd just be racked with stress the entire time. But, but with those, we we come out of it. But I quite liked it because you kind of go, all right, well, we're at Bill's house, everything's safe, and then it's not, and all that kind of stuff. But when, um we do a certain sequence. We don't break the found footage anymore. We stop that. Mm-hmm. We just stay in it. And uh, you go, oh, when are we going to break found footage? You go, we're not. And then you kind of go, oh, I'm stuck with this person now. Like, this is this is brutal. And I, I, I like it when things like that happen. You go, all right, the rule is that your movie says you stop that now. I'm going, no, we're not stopping it now. And you go, oh, no. <laughs> so it was definitely a tool to to set things up as well, which was exciting to do oh yeah and and i like that you don't kind of like stick to like rules or whatever because like i feel like like rules work to kind of like create a consistency but at the same time like an over adherence it just feels like um we're losing the character we're losing the story and we're following rules yeah well well isn't that the yeah so we only had you can say that 
should a should logic overstep something be scary? You know what I mean? Like, should it always prioritize the horror? But then if you go too far, you go, well, that's so illogical. I'm actually just annoyed that the character would do something like that. And you got to find that balance too, haven't you? So it's the same with the rules. You go, which rules am I allowed to break? Because you want me to, and it's going to be more enjoyable versus, all right, you've just lost me now. You've broke the rules too much. So, yeah, the rules are interesting. Like, that was another reason why I didn't go full found footage. There is quite stringent rules where people start going, ah, that wouldn't happen in found footage. You know, like, well, how are we watching this? Looks like, you know, this looks like a finished edited piece now versus finding a tape that was buried and all that kind of stuff. You know know what I mean? When you go into found footage, there's avid, there is, it, it has a very respected place in horror, but people are passionate about that genre. And if you don't do it the way they want it to, yeah. they will rinse you for it. So, yeah, they've not come for me yet. That's good. Yeah, but at the same time, I, I do enjoy being surprised. I do enjoy thinking in my head, this is what's going to happen and having it not happen. Because yes, like it kind of shows a thought process and... You know, this is the way other people do it, but what is my way of doing it? And it's like a like a sense of creativity in there. I think, yeah, I agree. And I think sometimes when filmmakers become a bit too rigid with their, you know, when you set out to make a film and you've obviously seen it work in other films and you just don't adjust, you don't follow the organic process of making a movie, that's when you get those kind of, you know what I mean? You kind of start predictable paint by numbers. So just by the fact, yeah, so just by the fact that we shot our film completely in Yorkshire in England, it it organically changed the way things would happen in a story anyways. So, um, yeah, so you kind of go, do you know, the way I sold it to people, they go, well, why Yorkshire and stuff like that? Don't you think it kind of cuts people? So the interest would be like, how will America think of a Yorkshire-based location of a film? And I go, it'd be foreign. But it's no different than me watching anything written by Stephen King, where he goes, it's always set in Maine. And I go, I, I've, I've never been to Maine. And I go, but that that's a new environment for me that gets me excited. Mm-hmm. So I go, yeah. I just, I want to learn about that environment. I don't know what it's like to live there. Tell me what it's like down at the shop, down at a cafeteria, down at a, you know what I mean, a diner. And I'm like, let's do it. But what is it like riding the bike in the evening in Maine? I don't know. So show me it. And I was hoping that, like especially the corner shop opening sequence, you all go, I don't relate to this at all. You go, oh, this is a new spin on a disappearance because I've not seen it like that. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah, and I do like that approach that you you make it specific because I do feel like the mm. you get you have kind of like um kind of like the Blum houses and the A24s of the world that like they used to be uh they used to be indie and now they're not because it's like we don't want to do anything that's going to like detract from an audience or piss anybody off. And we don't want to be authentic. We don't want to tell a story because you end up sacrificing all of that when you don't, when, when you don't dive in, when you don't get specific. Cause I think there's a level yeah, of specificity you wanna... that works. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's like they've gone for that mainstream audience appeal now. So they can't, they can't hone in on anything. Is what you... Yeah. So it's interesting because that the hunger for, I think the horror community, the hunger for originality and something a bit different is always going to be there, isn't it? So, um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm just really pleased that um, we did, we did what you suggest, like you said, which is we tried to do something a bit different just by the the locale and, and, and I don't know how much you guys know over there about the history of the Moors, the real history of the Moors. That actually uh, had a massive influence. I knew nothing about it going in. I was just like oh. to me, yeah, like it felt like I think I mentioned this earlier. It felt the the best thing I can, can describe it, or it's akin to like the um, the Texas Killing Fields kind of. It's it's a large mm-hmm. area. It's very mysterious. Lots of myth involved. Like that's the way I felt about it. Well, so the film will play quite differently in the UK than it will to anywhere else. I think because of the actual history of the Moors now. When Paul Thomas, the writer, developed it, he took real things from history and then he created a fictional story. And um, three things stand out quite a bit, which is, I don't know if you've heard of the Moors murders that, was, uh, that happened in the 60s. It was quite I horrible. Haven't. I didn't want to 
I didn't want to delve too deep into those, but it's a large part of the Moors history. Um, for people listening, if they want to look into it, they love their true crime. That's there. It went from Yorkshire. That happened in um, Lancashire, but it's very close by. And that was kind of a starting point in a way, but that was not my personal interest in it. So basically two people did some horrible things with kids and the Moors and stuff like oh, that. Okay. And it, yeah, it's it's not it's yeah, I'm not happy. It's not a good thing. Bad, bad, bad things. And um, yeah, I'm glad you didn't dive too far into I, that. I didn't want to. That was not my interest in the piece. So when it was presented to me, I was interested in um the northern trauma of it all. So how it affected people. I, I don't like glorifying killers as much myself personally. I I, I know that the, you know there's places for it in cinema, but I I'm more interested in the people surrounding that. So the focus on Claire and Bill was what interested me, which is this, um, what happens after. And it's like in the North, we have this Northern trauma that still haunts us. So when we, I was a kid of the nineties, this happened in the sixties. And when you're playing in the playground, you can see the moors in the hills in the distance and stuff. And your parents like never go to the moors. And you're like, why? <laughs> yeah. And like, you go, just don't go there. And so me and Paul, the writer, as kids, we'd come up with our own, like, what's up there? What boogeyman is up there? And the film is more about that. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. you try to tap into the kid's interpretation of what something real happened. Um, and then he took also from, because um, it's thousands of years of history. There was in Cheshire, which is further over, they found someone called the Lindau. They called it the Lindau, which was a preserved body in the peat. So it was like, he was sacrificed and he was strangled oh, wow. and he was buried in the peat. But because of the peat in the soil, there's something in it that like pickled him. It preserved him. So he's perfectly preserved. Oh. And then there's standing stones. So there's also these, like in Ilkley Moor, there's these standing stones with these, these little symbols on them. So basically Paul just pulled in all of it and um, used it as a springboard to create a completely original idea. Um, That's awesome. But what's really like, but what, what I'm saying, what's really interesting is, um, my personal interest was in how these kinds of things affect a town because I was a kid where it was like one, two generations down. And I could still feel it a little bit. Um, but making a fil- but releasing that film in the UK versus in the US, there's going to be a different reaction to it. Does that make sense? So, like, you know, they're going to be like, oh, it's about that. And you go, no, it's not about that. Just go watch it and you'll, you'll find out. But there's a gut reaction to it because it's still quite, it's still quite, even like, so many years, 50 years later, it's still quite raw. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, different different vibe here to what you got, I think. Yeah. and But I, I do, because we watched a few uh, films from the UK, and, like, I do always enjoy the ones that go small rather than big, because you get that authentic kind of feel. Because, like, like you said, it's like, I've never been to Maine, but... Like if the only thing that I ever know is watching this movie, like I'd like an authentic experience kind of thing. And yeah. I, I agree with that. Um, but the the one the the part that I enjoyed about this most is I'm not like I'm not a huge fan of the supernatural, but maybe it's the way it's been applied in movies. And okay. the way this movie does it, I like that it's it's sort of rooted in Bill. How the way, at least the way I took it, how mm. how he like y- you hear those stories of families that have lost a child that will go to a psychic or go to, you know, like, you know, whoever um, when it's years and years down the road and they could not believe in it or believe in it. But it's like, this is my option kind of thing. And that's the way I take his uh, his kind of involvement in it. So it, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So we always perceive Bill as a hammer and nail kind of guy. If there's a nail, I'll hammer it. And that's I'm going to get on with it. Or it's like, what if after 25 years you just can't find that nail, and somebody else says they can? You go, I'll believe it. God, tell me where this. As long as you lead me to the nail, I'll hammer it. So yeah. even though it's doing supernatural means to find that nail, I don't think he he thinks too hard whether he believes it or not. He's like, can you find something? It's that's that's that 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 depth of character where you go clearly the way he's designed he shouldn't believe in the supernatural but he's gotten so desperate and he needs just anything to go on to keep him going they'll go yeah go on then let's do that then 
and then oh we think it's there that's enough for me i think because obviously in the backstory his wife was more into all that kind of thing mm-hmm. and he just kind of he just whatever made her feel better he was like go on then and then mm-hmm. when so we had a like she kind of backstory again passed before the film starts um he's kind of got nothing but he's got this contact and he's like all right go on then tell me where i should look and then obviously in the movie he may or may not find something here or there and uh he's like all right cool i can hit a nail again find me another nail <laughs> it's not so um it, it's kind of interesting to watch someone who i also think isn't much of a believer believing for practical reasons yeah so, it's interesting which i I, that's one of the, this is one of the few like supernatural things in movies that I've just been like, that makes sense to me. Like, this is the one I can, I can get behind. Cause a lot of times it's like, uh, you see it in the movies and, or in movies and it's just like, well, this is where the plot is going. So this is what we're going to do. And it doesn't feel normal or natural to the characters. And you just like feel people betraying their character to go along with it kind of thing. Well, that's no, that that that's that's really cool. I actually, really appreciate that because we spent so much time because we're not we're an indie, so we went what costs nothing but will add value. And you go story, character, performance, absolutely. Like, do you know what I mean? So we didn't go like, oh, I just need to do a big VFX. If I did that big vista, they'd really think I'm amazing. We were like, no, like like let's make people because we're like I said again, we're, we're doing this northern film. How are people going to connect with them? We go well on an emotional level. This stuff is quite relatable as a parent you can relate like disappointing or disappointing a parent because let's be honest claire is almost coming across as someone who can never can never get that love from the father figure do you know what i mean it's like Mm -hmm. there's there's a scene where she talks about the hook doesn't she and you just go oh no don't 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 go following him for that hug (laughs) do you know what i mean so all that emotional stuff is relatable whether you don't you don't recognize the environment. You don't recognize the Moors or any of that stuff. You go, but I, I, I am grounded and anchored to these characters. And I'll, I, I was doing a, an interview this this morning actually, and they were like, "I don't like horror. Like, how would you get me to watch this film?" And I go, "The characters. Yeah. You'll 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 go through horror with them because of the characters." So, well, yeah, because it's definitely like, at least like, uh, I want to say like stateside here, it's like. Horror is, if you're talking, the bulk of horror in the United States is blood and guts, slasher, body counts, um, and that comprises a lot of horror. And occasionally, which, which is it, also good. I like which that. Is good, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But like, and occasionally you'll get like really good character moments, and like maybe a story that you're like, I can get behind that. Like most of the time you're just like, oh, they're here because they're supposed to die. Like that's why they made this decision. Like, but in this movie, yeah. I don't feel like there's ever a moment where I'm like, why would they do that? I agree. Yeah. And what's also interesting is I think there is characters in this film. If it was slightly a shade towards that, you go that they're, they're going to go first and they yeah. don't. And you go, oh, okay. Like, that's the moment where that person should go. And then you go, no, no, that's not this kind of movie. And you go, oh, I don't know what you're going to do then. Like, and you go, maybe you're not going to do anything. No, we're going to do something. You're like, <laughs> oh, I don't know what to do then. So we, we, we enjoyed that aspect. We go as horror fans ourselves, you go, well, that person's purpose should end here. And then they need to be dispatched because that's services, the story and not the character and all this kind of stuff. And uh, we enjoy playing around with that where, um even just the point where a character might it, you never really have in films where a character goes you know what i'm done like i'm not following you into this it's very rare you have a character go you know what time out i'm going home actually and i don't have to worry about this anymore <laughs> and you go yeah yeah fair <laughs> fair enough like which where's I, that I do, character I, I liked that part a lot where that happens okay. and like, i've like because a lot of this was like was like I've never seen it done in this way. It's like I've seen these characters before. It's like I've seen mm. the podcaster, I've seen the grieving father, I've seen the psychic. But like a lot of the times I think like maybe I'm coming from like a like an 80s like 90s perspective where like 
the the psychic was always like it, it was very mystical and it was like ooh, ooh, you know like and they always overplayed it a little bit whereas this feels very natural very real and like the father like you show the grieving father but you don't want to show him too much because we don't want to get it too sad like there's always like these these barriers that were put on things and people weren't allowed characters weren't allowed to kind of like be the character and be in the character yeah no i agree and just to you know the mention of the psychic so the grounded character thing that was not how it was originally written so really? um paul yeah paul had this treatment in a draw for a while and i think originally the i hope you don't be sharing this but i think it's facts we changed it so he was inspired by the warrens before the conjuring came out okay. so the father daughter dynamic was was more like oh okay book. i see that yeah yeah and we had it as that and then i remember reading it years and years when i was like graduating unions i don't know how when it was i read it and i was like yeah cool all right and then we went and did other things and then when we came back to it this is the conjuring like the conjuring's <laughs> well been out by now like he was like oh no there were real people that's what i based it off and i was like yeah okay fair enough but then it was like all right are they brother and sister are they whatever what are they then because we can't do that again and then when we came up well, I think Paul came up with the father-daughter relationship. And then it was like, oh, like they almost parallel, like they're, they're almost like a reflection, not reflection, what's the word I'm looking for? But you compared them to Bill and Claire. So you got this really loving father that's like trying to convince his daughter not to put herself into trouble. And then you've got this other father figure dragging her into hell. And he just, just, just for his own ends, do you know what I mean? So it, it was nice that that was like a happy natural thing that happened where you've got these two father daughter type relationships playing against each other um, yeah and that that was not originally there it was it was it's that organic process of trying to make things work with what you have and and adjusting accordingly so that i was quite happy with how eleanor turned out in the end you know and yeah the actress it, it plays a... definitely like this this is one like i was just like i was like I was like, I really hope this guy wants to talk to us because, like, I want to know about this movie because, like, the like we have fun with the slasher stuff and stuff like that, and it's like, and I enjoy talking to them about the creative process and the gore, the gags, and and all that. But for this, yeah, one, yeah I've, I've listened to them. I've listened to them. They're really fun. I like there was one you were talking about where um, you were like, oh, you're not. I was like near the end of the movie, there was like no plot armor applied, and you're like, oh, good, <laughs> like, like, get rid of them. No, I, 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 it's nice to play around with tropes like that. So I, I, yeah, I've enjoyed listening to that. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh yeah, no, no, you're good. Um, but then the, like with this, I was like, I want to know the creative process behind this because you really did create something that is unique and different, and like this is a movie that I think speaks to the the person who loves horror the person who loves true crime like that that gets into the supernatural it has all those elements and it does it in a way that it's not overplaying one over the other awesome yeah so yeah it's interesting so I'm trying to think about where to start with that so you got me and paul thomas horror fans and we looked at films like you know, I think he's big inspiration. I don't know if you've seen it. Don't look now. Which one? You've seen that one? Don't look now. Um. Yes. It's got, it's got the funkiest ending. Yes, it does. It really it messes you up a bit. And he took from that, and I took from, I think like the Wicker Man and stuff like that. Okay. But I'm a bit of an Exorcist kid. And then we just yeah. kind of went, how do we incorporate all that with the history of Yorkshire? and then put it in a melting pot. And to answer your question now, I remember what I was going to say, oh, is when right. we had the, yeah, yeah, we, I remember it now, is like, <laughs> we didn't think we had anything truly original. We just thought it was good. And we were like, okay, this is a story worth telling. It's not, because Paul's a very smart writer, and he's come up with some really unique stuff that you go, oh, that's a really good play on the genre, and you wouldn't see it coming. With this one, it was more, no, this is just, this just works. But like through the act of making it, things would adjust accordingly. And then people have just gone, I didn't see it go that way. And you go, oh, okay. So it's it's just 
knowing the genre and playing within it, you start to kind of zig left instead of right because you go, that would annoy me if I zigged the same way I expect every time. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. like, for instance, like I said, for Paul, he was like, he always wanted to put in a character that goes, you know what, I'm out. <laughs> He's always <laughs> watched a horror film and gone, why is nobody doing that? Yeah. Because um, Bill can't do that. Bill can't leave. He's never allowed to leave, but other characters can. And yeah. you kind of go, all right, well, why do they never do that then? Like, we get him, we get her, why not them? Like, they yeah. leave. And we got a kick out of that. And then it, it kind of not pulls the rug from under you, but you kind of go, all right, well, now I don't know what you're going to do. And I really like that. Even just like the, you speak of body counts, how many people should die? One, two, how often do they die? Can you, you know, if, you, if one person dies, does it take away if that person dies? What if nobody dies? What if everybody dies? <laughs> and you kind of go, what would catch people out the most with that? So if you kill five people within 15 minutes, you know what kind of movie you've got. Exactly. It's, it's a body yeah. count movie. Yeah. Body count movie, yeah. So Which, okay, no, I, so, I loved all that stuff. Um, Like you kind of like speak to like that part when, you know, when, when the number of people going back kind of shrinks, like, um. Hmm that to me like that part and, and and all of that like it makes everything feel more intimate it makes everything in a way almost feel bigger like like the stakes have been raised kind of and and i do love um the way it leads to the ending because the that ending it's like i didn't see it coming but at the same time it makes sense for the world that it's set in so it's like it's surprising but it's not out of left field which i think is like the perfect spot for an ending well it's, it's like we were saying earlier it's like with horror with dread you go i know where this is going please don't go there and then you kind of just you just kind of feel it you're not necessarily mm -hmm. consciously aware of it but you go where else can it go and then it goes there and you're not like mm, i called it you're like oh no it just it just makes too much sense and i never wanted this to happen yeah um, yeah and I felt that way the I, entire I, time in the end. Did you? Okay. <laughs> like okay. I just uh, felt oh. like this dread in my in my chest. Oh, that, that makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the um, I'll tell you why I wanted to do the movie is when I read the treatment, um the ending got me. It was like, Good oh, ending. I don't like that ending. I don't like that. No, I exactly, yeah. I was like. Oof, I don't know if I'm feel good making this kind of ending. And then I sat on it and I went, that's why I should do it. Like I've heard like a famous director go, if it, if it, if it scares you, you should do it. It means somebody hasn't done that version yet. Like you should do it. And so my deal with the writer was like, we can change anything, but don't change the ending. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we only changed it ever so slightly, um, ever so slightly. But that was my mission statement was to get to that ending that what is it um i have a friend who's a filmmaker and she called it film grief when she watched it she goes i got film grief it took me a day or two to like get rid of that feeling that the, the ending created and i was chasing that because that's what i felt when i watched the wicker man i was like you can't do that to him like he's a good man who went out of his way to help a child and you're gonna do that to him and then it ends i hate you i hate this movie I'm going to think about it for three days, annoyed. And then 10 years later, I go, really impacted me. Actually, it must have been a really solid movie because I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So, yeah. yeah. So that's that's the horror effect, isn't it? You kind of love oh, yeah. punishing you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like those so, are the ones that's like, um, um, it, it's just like certain movies. It's, it's like you'll like the ending, just the, the abrupt stopped ending. It either, it either like, works or doesn't and then this one like it, it was that feeling of like wanting more but like in a good way that like mm. like i'm in my head i'm thinking you know like i i've gotten everything in explanation this movie has promised but it's like like i f i feel like there's more i'd like to know and it's like it's a good spot to leave it at I hope so, because obviously I like a bit of ambiguity, but some people don't. And um, I think the people who do will really get a kick out of it. Um, there's certain things we leave un un unexplained 
Uh, and I just like that fear of the, if you, if you answer everything in a horror film, then there's nothing to fear. You know it all. Like if mm-hmm. you go, that thing's still in the woods after the film closes, you go, well, now I don't feel great about the woods. So I, I like that a little bit. myself. and you mentioned about how, when they became just a smaller team at the end, that's kind of like action movies in a way you can have these big, a hundred set piece fight sequences. And then it's like, now it's boss time. It's one-on-one. It's more about oh, yeah. the, 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 personal struggle versus the fight definitely um we're gonna deal with demons now we're gonna have to talk about it we're gonna have to get really raw and you're like oh here we go so i'm glad i'm glad we got to do that that was really fun oh yeah we're being so well sorry go ahead finish no i was gonna say we're being so like uh we're going into the philosophy of horror here aren't we we're getting very ethereal it's like i wonder if people can follow us because we're being ambiguous but it's yeah. it's it's all exciting stuff though about horror. this is the the nitty gritty of horror, isn't it? It's not well. I put my camera here and I put my camera there, which we can do. But it's just the, the about creating a feeling that's really it's interesting, isn't it? Well, yeah, and that's the thing is like um, I've noticed from just like other directors we talked to, and I've really enjoyed their stuff. Is they'll get complaints. It was like um, who was it? John Eisberg did Final Summer, and um, I don't I don't know if that one's like like done big in the uk i think it was like a streaming and it had like a couple theaters showings but um the one of the big complaints he got because he did like a summer camp slasher was there's not enough blood but like for me i was like you only need to add the blood and hype up the kills and add more kills when you don't have enough story at a certain point yeah that like your your kills and all that should fit your story that when you start doing too much, it starts to take away from your vision a little bit. And like, I don't know where I was going with that, but like, I think that's like, um, it's going like, deep. It's going to another level of figuring things out. It's not just yeah. going, what am I showing people? It's like, I'm taking them on an emotional journey and I know when to implement it. Isn't it? It's yeah. kind of, yeah, it's the puppet mastery thing. Cause, um, uh, I'll tell you that this is me being very honest with you. Like, I like the fact that you really resonate with the movie and a lot of people have, but what's really interesting, sometimes we get um, people who are really into true crime and murder mystery and all that kind of stuff. They've reviewed and gone, we really love it until like the third act. And then it kind of, and then I've got horror fans going, oh, it takes ages, but when it hits that third act, <laughs> yeah. and you're just kind of going, you can't please everyone really. So like, I think, there's there's a bit of a conclusion in near the end and everybody went that was the right way to do it and then you you undid it and you go it was never meant to be that like it it's again we're being ambiguous but like oh sorry vague but it you you hope that you can please everyone but to do your own honest stamp on it you're gonna not do exactly what one person envisioned it especially if you want to be different like you mentioned if if you're being different then it's gonna go a different way that you probably didn't expect it to some people really love going into the wilderness some people don't like it they like to know what's coming and they like to be ahead of the movie um which is a shame but you know each to their own i i, I like the fact that they go oh i don't know if you should have gone that way with it and i've got it <laughs> that way. as a horror fan i'm like yeah. i got i got a non-horror fan to think it was fine to think to think they were gonna find something and make up and be happy I love that you thought that. <laughs> it's, it's quite satisfying. So uh, as a non-horror fan, I'm like, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> it wasn't a true crime. I'm sorry. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just enough of each, which I, I did enjoy. Um, so we have, uh, like, our, our final questions that we ask. They're not really, like, you know, too hard-hitting or deep or whatever, but just basically, like, uh, what have you been watching lately that you would recommend to us? Oh, man, I have, I've watched less um, just because when you're in this mode of promote, because I'm obviously putting the movie around, I'm doing like Q&As and stuff like that. Everything like watching films feels like work. So I got opposite. So when oh, I want to make a movie again, I'll watch horror again. So, okay. and I've picked the movie I want to come back to. Like, I need to go see Long Legs. I need to see that movie. Oh, movie yeah. Now. So I've held off. I've been watching things like Godzilla Minus One and all that. I'm like, I'm not making a Godzilla movie anytime soon. So 
I've literally gone the other way until I go back in, but I've got a list of, you know, have you heard about Spielberg when he makes a movie, he has these three films. He always goes back and watches and and gets him amped up. Yeah. So I think it's like, is it, um, Lawrence of Arabia, the searchers, and it's one more. And then he goes, all right, I'm good to make movies again. Let me go. Like like, that lets him off the chain. And, Hands down, the film I have to do that with is The Exorcist. And it's such a cliche answer. But I it's made so long ago, but the 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 craftsmanship of that movie still is strong. Like kids being creepy has been done to death since The Exorcist. You know, the cut the you know, the religious implications are not as powerful now with modern audiences and all that kind of stuff. But if you just watch it on a like a a competent director level and acting. It's still fantastic. Oh yeah, and you just go, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm not saying anything new here either, am I? Like, but that's like my reset. I, I kind of okay. go, do I want to watch horror again? Watch The Exorcist. Yes, I do. Like it's, and then I, do you not have that? Like, does that go to horror that goes? I know the film that will put me back in, and then I'll watch something fresh. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah. No, I understand because that is that is the one of the classics i i love the exorcist like i I do feel like they kind of messed with the formula a little too much in the new one because like steeping it in the catholic mythology made it creepy made it real made it feel like you know as big as this is it could happen you know like whereas the new one it's like you have all these people from these different religions and it's like that's a choice. I mean, you could make that choice, but I mean, they all kind of conflict in a way that I don't know if it works. It- I know what you mean. I, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would have to agree with that. And yeah, I just have to, yeah, I agree with it. And Mike Flanagan is doing the next one, which I'm curious about. I'm actually quite optimistically curious about. Oh, he's good. Um, yeah. Well, it's weird. It's like me and the writer was talking about how, with a TV show, it's hard to do a horror ending with a TV show because you have to invest so long in it. But then if you watch the ending of Haunted Hill House, you went, huh, just went all happy, happy Dory at the end there a little bit. And then he did it with, was it Midnight Mass? He actually managed to figure it out. And you're like, oh, okay, okay. You, you, you know how to get there in the end. So I'm really excited about that. But The Exorcist was another one for, and what you think of this is, because you, I'm guessing you've watched a trip. When I'm in, research mode and enjoyment mode i watch tons of horror then i don't and then i do and then i don't where you seem to watch it consistently we do yeah um, yeah so which is as a tr- as a horror th- in horror which is usually the most memorable part of the film is it like the mid the mid level like the halfway point scare is it the ending is it two-thirds because, and I'll, I'll throw out, and you can disagree with me, it doesn't seem to always be, unless it's the whole film's tailored to it, it's never really the ending. It's some kind of midpoint scare where you like, you know, like sinister or stuff like that, where you just go, oh, it's like the lawnmower or, you know, like hereditary. It's always these kind of midpoints where you go, like the exorcist where the head turns around. Like those are the scenes people talk about and they oh, yeah. forget about the endings. So that was for us. With the more, we really wanted to make sure that the last frames were the most memorable because, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, because I actually I love the ending of The Exorcist. I think it's, a, it's people think it was like a sacrilegious film, I'm like it's got the most religious, hopeful ending ever. <laughs> oh, yeah, like crazy. it definitely like dives deep into Catholicism and makes the movie about Catholicism, which is the thing I appreciate it the most because. It doesn't, it doesn't pull back. It doesn't, you know, like, well, what if people aren't going to be in this? It's like, no, this is what the movie's about. Yeah. Like it, it's, it, it sticks on its point as opposed to pushing, uh, pushing back from it a little bit. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And also I'm looking into, so the research part, what is considered a horror? So is seven a horror, would you say? Or is it a thriller with teeth? I, I don't, as a kid, I always thought that was horror because it, I mean, like you could call it, um, what is it like a cop procedural? You could call it thriller, but I feel like it had enough 
like gore and elements like that that I feel like it it moves into horror. And and Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, that's that's definitely horror. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Because that's the next film we're working on. And that's these are the type of films we're looking at. And you're kind of going, are we going to get called a thriller? Or do we have I mean, to like apply more violence and gore and stuff for them to believe you that it's a horror? And you don't want to be like you say, you don't want to do it for the sake of it, do you? So it's really interesting that line. Yeah. Which you 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 kind of mentioned a little bit. That would be our next question. Like, do you have anything you're working on that you can talk about? Well, at this stage, because we're still releasing the movie, but there's a few ideas we've got, and one of them, uh, that's why I want to see long legs, because I don't want to do long legs, but I had something in a similar vein that I'll have to change now, um, hence why I mentioned Seven and Silence of the Lambs and all this kind yeah. of stuff, because my, wi- my wife is CSI, and she's been like telling me stories of her job for years, and she joked, well, you should do a horror film about me, and I went, actually, <laughs> <laughs> and then we started, I just started taking scenarios and twisting them, and she went, duh, I have to go back to work tomorrow. And uh, that started to really manifest into something really interesting. Wow. And I'm just trying to make sure that I don't, when you've got, like you said, that procedural element. CSI, most people don't know what CSI actually is because of the TV show. They've kind of changed what it actually is. It's nothing like that. No, it isn't. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, so it's we get to explore that too. It's interesting. But when does it leave thriller and become horror? I think I've figured it out, but I wanted to poke your brain and go, when does it leave your territory of horror? Well, yeah, I think, you know, if you're, if you're willing to go deep and you're willing to go dark and you're willing to go a little gory and kind of like push it in that direction. And like that makes it horror. It's like, cause I kind of feel like seven has that psychological edge to it. And then like, yeah um but it also has these gross disgusting moments that you're like you just get one look at it and you're just like grossed out and then um hannibal is like more of like a well that that entire series really is more of like psychological horror the I mean, tv show the film series yeah like the the film series that i think the tv show was more horror than the actual like well more gore horror way more yeah i thought that too i've watched i've rewatched it a bit recently and you go which i love that a show. lot of oh yeah they, they they definitely go far with those those themes yeah. but you're like some of the where the body parts are left around you go that's nightmare fuel for sure that, yeah like it's 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 gross um <laughs> yeah but definitely but no that's why i'm that's what i'm looking in that's what i'm looking into at the moment all that kind of stuff so that's that's a little hint and if everybody's already called out the fact the first half feels semi-true crime i'm kind of going well obviously it's already in there a little bit i just won't mind adding a bit more teeth to that part of it Do you know what i mean so mm-hmm. but it's early doors early doors so definitely um and uh before we wrap up um where uh, like what uh where can people find you on social media Instagram mostly, I think. I'm Film Cronin, so it's very simple. It's just film with my last name. Um, I'm on Twitter as well and stuff, but I've got a website, but I, I mostly just hover on Instagram because it's all pictures and visuals, which is kind of our platform really, isn't it? So you'll find me on there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for talking to me, and uh, I really appreciate this. No worries. No, I've enjoyed it. Thank we. Thank you for listening to this podcast. This podcast is available on all major podcast networks and YouTube. If you like what you're hearing, please follow, like, and subscribe on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook.